I am unbelievably excited to have on this podcast. And I have no idea what we're going to talk about, but I know it's going to be good. Um, well, can I can I just say I'm really, really chuffed to be on this because for me, privately, you have been you've written handbooks for my life and you helped me live. And not only am I an avid daily follow uh, of your incredibly practical and helpful Instagram, but I've read all of your books and from way back now. So I feel I've had a relationship that has you have no idea about it we've been friends for years Julia (laughs) but grief works this too shall pass and then lately every family has a story and I go back and I glean from it and you're my teacher you really are my teacher and I I think you're a godsend and I thank you for every jewel that your brain concocts and for your compassion I think I might cry now. You can cry. Um, it's a safe place. <laughs> it's not meant to be this way round. <laughs> well, the part, I, I will say this, the challenge of being, there's one, I mean, I've had difficulty thinking of which challenge to pick for this, but one challenge um, of being well known is that one is entirely sick, gets one very, very sick about talking about oneself. Um, I thought... I had a challenge about thinking which challenge I should pick. Um, Could you just give us a list of what they were? I've got you a menu like, so you can choose. Okay. I thought I okay. thought it would be useful for you guys to think of one that, you know, one that you haven't already done. Um, and I think the only use about sharing challenges and difficulties is to, and any kind of pain, is so that it helps other people. Exactly. It. So I can, I can tell you, shall I just read you one little poem about my IT challenge? This is a micro, there's micro and macro challenges. Okay. And I think a lot Let's of the day, micro. living, first of all, living is hard. That is, that is a, I think, full stop. A meta. Like, like, yeah, yeah, that's a big one. And inside it, one of the many things that um, I think a day can throw at one, and it can sometimes be an assault course, for me, anything IT. And there's this poem that has given me much solace. I don't know if you know Mary Oliver. I love Mary Oliver. Yeah. Do, she's you, my, do you know? Yes, my goddess. She's my goddess too. Uh, do you know this poem called What I Can Do? No. Okay, good. Tell me. Thank God for that. Yes, I'm giving something to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay it's very this is short. so reverse role right now by the way but no i like doing plan, it but it's called mischief <laughs> okay. It, okay. mischief is paramount in life okay what i can do it's very short by the way so you don't have to tune out the television has two instruments that control it i get confused the washer asks me do you want regular or delicate honestly i just want clean everything is like that <laughs> I won't even mention cell phones. I can turn on the light of the lamp beside my chair where a book (laughs) is waiting. But that's about it. Oh, yes. And I can strike a match and make fire. That says it all for me. Oh, my God. That should be a genius. Wallpaper. Yes. Okay, we're going to do merchandise. We will do merchandise. I think it's something, I find everything ramifies into complications in modern life, you know, and choice. That's a micro one. <laughs> so if I can take my role back. Okay, you can try. <laughs> Let's can see how try. long it lasts. Yeah. Okay, not long. Yeah. When you were listing your challenges, let's get a list of what they were. So there's the micro of IT. I mean, there's the acknowledgement that life is difficult. And I think that is a good one to start with, because I think if we think it isn't difficult, we somehow feel that we're failing. Whereas if we know like life is difficult and days can feel like assault courses, like you said, that is a sort of more prepared state of going for the day. Absolutely. And I think it also helps us to combat um, reasons why what you call the shitty committee or I called it my 
when I was 15, I identified that I was, I had a self-destructive part. I called it the SDP. And um, wow. which That's was quite sophisticated thinking for a 15 year old. Eh? I was much more sophisticated when young than I'm old. I've gone backwards. I really have. Um, and I was born old. And I think that was slightly problematic for me. But the SDP has made and learning to live with my SDP and your shitty committee. That's a challenge. So I think I've spent a lot of my life thinking of ways to combat it. And one of those things is to get there before they do. So saying like, hang on, life is difficult. Before you tell me that I'm stupid, it's like, it's not my fault, you know? Um, one thing yeah, that I've... You, mm. Well, because if... I mean, SDP is a 15-year-old and you've just said a whole mass of things that I really want to go into, that you were old when you were young and then you're young now that you're old. But I also felt that when you were young, there were things that happened that may have arrested your development. You know, Definitely. Like, like your mum's breakdown, like your dad's illness, um, changing school. I I think um, I think I had to deal with very big things very young. So in a way, maybe I didn't have the space to be a child. And I remember, not through anybody's fault, just the the fault of life and, as they say, shit happens. Um, so, and I remember when I was about 13, which was interesting enough, when I became an actor, and I think it's a total response to what my, happened to my father, I felt a sense of wanting to stay young. And I think that's also something that, wanting to keep my childhood keep and prolong the childhood that somehow the innocence had already been had already been exploded and um so it took me a long time as an adult if I have become an adult that's questionable to grow up um having said that it's never it's never one thing is it I mean genetically my granny if you met my grandmother not Violet but my mother's mother she was somebody who was you know she was 89 and she was seven years old so you know she had a great very young disposition my mother has a very young and wise disposition so there's a lot that we're handed down and then the more and more that we hear about transgenerational stuff that we get handed down um given what you know has happened to them, I remember being very, very, very young and thinking I'm young. I am older than my grandmother. I remember, which was not Gosh. a laugh a minute, reading uh, at Speech and Drama in, in South Hampstead. We had to pick a poem and, um, you know, learn it and recite it. And looking back on it, it's completely barking because I think I was eight or nine and I chose John Clare's I am yet what I am. No one cares or no. <laughs> I was a laugh a minute as an eight-year-old. But I had this weight of sadness, I think. Or the Germans call it, is it the Weltschmerz or something? I've just been learning German yeah, compound yeah. words. I was born with it. And I think that's helped me. Um, it's it's helped inform, you know, perhaps why I I can bring something to parts because I've been here before. Why have the weight of the exhaustion of being? I think that's my maybe why I go to sleep for most of my life, and that's something that I do often. When in doubt, I go and do. Um, I have a snooze. I have a horizontal. But can I? I need to try and track. Yes, I know. Where Sorry, we've about gone. That. <laughs> no, it's a challenge. I mean, well, I mean, the sense that I'm making of it that is fascinating, and I think will other people will hear themselves and what you're saying is that we have a very simplistic view of ourselves but actually we are very complex beings and what makes us me is what we inherit genetically so from both sides of your grandparents and your parents what happens to us, like your mum's breakdown when you were five and your dad becoming profi was he profoundly disabled? He was in a wheelchair. From profoundly, the yeah, from 50. Profound yeah, that went 50, wrong, yeah. When you were 13. And somehow you were born with a wisdom that was a, sounds like it slightly was too much when you were young. 
and but you wanted to hold on to your childhood so you developed many parts one was this self-critical part which feels quite cruel mm. but another one was a like a young part that could play and be an actress and be a different different versions of yourself but how you your defense against all of this energy that's inside you is to go to sleep so do you retreat I've probably missed something but you no, you have that make sense anything. it makes total sense I think um I definitely um there was two things and this is part of the problem is when I get scattered is which which path to choose um my response I think to what happened to dad and to my mom and this wish to prolong my childhood was definitely um was me was me running away and becoming an actor because I thought I could create my own reality and I could control that so I could step away if life and I remember being really quite stubborn at 13 when it happened to dad saying this is not going to defeat us and my father it didn't defeat my father in spirit and it certainly wasn't going to defeat me in my sense of um optimism and I just mm. thought it's up to me what to make of it um actually there's a quote above my desk which says it's our task to make to make music of what remains and I love that has that been a has that been a guiding influence totally and I've got another one which is put magic in today that's from my mother I think oh. it's been a um it's our choice. We're given what, what happens to us. And there's a huge amount of luck that has been come my way and privilege, including the actual people that ended up being my parents. I really strongly believe that has been my biggest privilege, as well as financial, as well as so much in that department and material. But the quality of people and how, it, and frankly, intact those two people are. I mean, they went through their own journeys um but they were meant to be parents you know not everyone and I often question that of myself what does that mean they were meant to be parents what does that mean for you it was their gift to be I mean they knew I didn't I felt they did a good job you know I yeah. played um this other day I played Sir Nicholas Winton's um I go to, on tangents, that's the problem with me. But Sir Nicholas Winton was an amazing man and I played his mother. And I was reading about Sir Nicholas Winton and he lived 106 and he did an extraordinary thing with his life. Wow. Yeah. He saved and all the Jews. He sa saved Jews. 450, yes, children from Prague. And he was asked what was his secret to his long life and um, loving life. And he said, well, number one, you choose your parents, which is obviously an acknowledgement of him to say I got lucky and we do get lucky we get in birth the moment of birth we're so lucky where we land which family we land which position in that family we land the geography of where we are um so, so much, much is random luck random or not then that's the other thing is that the older I've got when lost and or I've become more and more intrigued by where I've come from and what I've been handed down and with a feeling of I have to fulfill the purpose of this short time that we're all given and what am I meant to be doing here I'm not always this serious by the way <laughs> but, but sometimes it's an important I think, question but it is what, and you what are like, you meant to be doing what are we meant to be doing with this time I mean are we meant to be learning how to do IT or do we just say oh that's not my gift you know um <laughs> or um are we meant but to do you have I an to... idea I interrupted you no do you have an idea of what your purpose is I'm guessing there I don't think it's acting acting has been my luxury and it's my hobby almost and it's my play um, is my way of coping and I love profoundly um, and I feel so lucky that I've got the chance to do it the 
the chance of being other people. I mean, it's um, it's and it stops you being scattered, doesn't it? It stops you being scattered, doesn't it? Because it gives you a script where you have a narrative and a line where you're going and you can inhabit that person you know where you want to get to, whereas life is much more messy and chaotic. Exactly. I've got a frame and I've got a sense of definition and I've also very got clear boundaries. I think I can, I'm naturally quite curious and I'm naturally quite generous, if I may say without, that's an unlikely thing for me to compliment myself, but I can be pulled in many, many directions and get very excited and that's, I think, that's why then I suddenly have to go to bed. Um, because I exhaust myself. But um, there was something else, wasn't there? There's always something In else. the purpose and meaning. What's the purpose? The purpose you, and meaning. It's not acting, yeah. what is it? Don't know yet. But you said you were fun. closer. I'm closer. I'm not close enough to articulate it. But I think um, there's something in, be, in being said that when one doesn't know necessarily what one's meant to do is to look at what you've been handed and where you've come from. And I do think death can be a real interrupter and a bugger of what, bugger in that way in that it's interrupted our parents, our grandparents, or whoever, were, they were doing something. So there's something that we're handed down in our DNA. Sometimes it's something we have to get rid of and say, sorry, this is not mine, just go away. And other times you go, actually, this is something that um, I can fulfill. So tiny thing, like as an actor, you get choices and you go like, shall I do it or not? And that's a challenge sometimes. It's great to have the choice, but then there's the responsibility of making the right decision. Um, so for instance, the Winton story came up. It wasn't an extraordinarily big part, but it was an extraordinary story and it completely tied in with what my grandmother and my grandfather on both sides did with their Second World War. So I felt in traveling back to that time, I was meeting them. And then there's another mm -hmm. funny thing that happens is that when I act people from different times and a lot of the time I am in the past professionally, um, I find I start encountering um, or people pop up. It's like being a hologram and my grandmother pops up. Like something like goes like, well, who's that? And I said, oh, it's my Auntie Lily or that's my. So there's a lot that we're receptacle. We're carriers of people who've gone before. And that's exciting because I'm all for, you know, I find death so, so heartbreaking because we feel it's final. It's so final on many levels. But any semblance that something carries on, that an energy carries on, or that there's a continuity, then um, then I, you know, I, I love pursuing that. Because and it sounds that. I, actually, and I, I find that a kind of inspiring thought that when... You know, you had very distinguished grandparents and parents on both sides. And rather than kind of looking at them from a distance and kind of feeling daunted by them or kind of overshadowed yeah. by them, it feels like you've, through your parts and through who you are, you've been able to step back and embrace them and let them become part of you. So you've integrated them through different pathways. And I guess what would be interesting to explore is how that might be then passed down to Nell and Billy, your two children. Yeah. What's it like being your child for them? Well, that is a very good question. It, it's a tricky one because I've got a lot to say about that, but I don't want to sort of cross, I don't want to talk about them out of turn, you know, and all for, um, them. All for them. And, um, I have, it's only recently that I thought, oh my God, um, it might not be such, I, it's difficult to see yourself objectively and I, me as a mother or what people project onto me is very different from me. And that's the thing of having somebody famous is that you aren't necessarily any of what other people think of you. You tend to be this projection of lots of people's others' opinions of you. And I think in order to survive being well known very quickly, you've got to recognize it really has very little to do with you. 
Hmm. People people will come come up when you go like, well, that's their perception. Well, that's what they need me to be, and it might be negative too. A lot of the time, it is negative, and that was quite a hard challenge when I was younger. Was having a lot of judgmental, negative opinion to deal with, and keeping before I had a sense of self, um, keeping my confidence intact. It was difficult to grow up actually because I was young. I was I was eighteen when it all happened. Mm -hmm. And um, it's kind of what what I recognize is so toxic about the Instagram and the social media is just when young people are forming themselves, they're making themselves vulnerable to strangers' opinions. And um, it really can make their own shitty committee triumphant with a within a second, you know, drown. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's so psychologically complicated, isn't it? You know, it's hard enough navigating one's own relationship with oneself and then how one has relationships with others, which is how we kind of live with a sense of love and connection in the world. But then being famous means that you have endless and limitless projections that are onto you, some negative, some positive, but also you had them before you were even developmentally mature. And so kind of working that out for you about how to protect yourself rather than ingesting them. And what you're talking about Instagram is that people do, they take them in and then it fucks with their head basically and who they are. But it sounds like you've done quite a lot of work to work out okay, that's them, that's their, what they need me to be, or as Jung said, you know, you put on to the other person what you most don't like or what you most like about yourself. It's nothing to do with the person. Well, it's like um, the Daily Mail, frankly, sometimes. Yeah. I mean, the Daily Mail is the shitty committee in, in publication, I find. So it can yes. be so toxic and so automatically judgmental and so vile. So when I'm having a shitty committee moment uh, and there are certain things that triggers, you know, get the shitty committee to go in chorus um I mean really particularly if I have to watch myself something I mean that's not something that any actor I think would would pretty much identify with watching oneself certainly brings my shitty committee into a huge chorus of triumph of <laughs> you know of uh so you could never undone. watch yourself I have to watch myself because I feel like it's an inverted narcissism because if I don't watch myself then I don't see everybody else's work and there's a lot film act film act film making is a team effort and there's a lot of at play of many many people's skills and that's kind of what I love about it mm -hmm. a lot of what I love about it is there's this group and I find quite touching is there's a group of people with all these disparate talents totally disparate sound design camera um pretending to be people makeup hair and they're all coming together to tell one story and it's like a mad dance too we're all trying to dance in sync all to the same tune that's up to the director or the conductor in a way so I force myself and also I am one thing I am really good at in the acting department is <laughs> I love this. The, the one thing I will absolutely say hand on heart and say positively is that I'm really good at something called ADR. Um, do you know what, what ADR? No. So ADR is the tech is the term in the biz, which is called additional dialogue recording. So you get the chance, well, sometimes you have to do it. At the end of a film, like some months later, they'll be putting the film together, they've edited it, and then eventually they have to come around to doing the sound. A lot of the sound that was on the original day is not usable because there's a plane or it interconnects, from, interconnects between two different takes so they don't match or so many different things. So you get the chance of doing a clean track. Um... And so they'll say, could you do that speech again or that line or that word? And it's all patchwork. Filmmaking is all a massive patchwork of moments, snatch, snitches, snatches. So as an actor, you're not in control of your performance. You do bits, you give it to the director, he'll choose 
the which choices out of all the takes that you've done and put it together and at the end of the day then you'll see the finished product and you'll see the finished product in context in the story so once it's the first time it's the last time really you you'll have seen it when you read the script in your head then you see it in reality and very often it is very different from what you intended choice wise and mm -hmm. also you have to get over the really impossible thing of you just aren't what you think you are and I think mm. um it's it takes a huge level of self-acceptance plus the fact once you've got over yourself and go like well whatever this is I can't do much about it this is what I am and this is what I've done then you can make different choices and go well okay so they've chosen that and that's the arc of the story I can do a different inflection on that or I can do if there was a line that had a potential laugh that's your time when you can go in and do it again because it's you finally see the context and context is everything so I now force myself to watch it um so that I know that I can improve it and do myself justice and I come it's a ridiculous process and I go down an abyss and uh, a vortex and then I come through it but the the amount of time spent in the vortex is lessened as I've gotten older wow <laughs> that's <laughs> exhausting <laughs> well it, it's fascinating but also it links to what you're saying about your SDP, and also being scattered, and also honing your craft, and the challenge, psychologically and emotionally, of doing something that really you have to put your your skill out there, but be at the mercy of other people of what they what they make of it. Yeah. So there's there's risk, and you have to trust. And what sounds fascinating actually and is similar to mini driver is that you recognize you go down a hole but you mm -hmm. are quicker at getting yourself up out of it that somehow the years of building muscle and kind of recognizing oh this is the hole it's not that yeah. you're never going to go down there and I think all of us know that we're going to go down that damn hole but it's knowing what gets you out there but the thing that's pinging in my head is I had this idea that acting gave you a route and a persona and so that that felt coherent, but what you're describing isn't that at all. Mm. It's coherent when I'm doing it. It's coherent and gives me a route and a wonderful map when I've just got the job, when I've got all the ideas, when I'm mapping it out. The One of the great joys in life for me is opportunity, you know, the... the sense of possibility oh I could do this and that and that that gives me a real buzz then doing it the play with people once you've gotten over the first day nerves or the nerves which one always has um because you've never played the same part twice that's the other thing and then you've never well it depends maybe you have worked with the same people but there's always nerves to deal with and then when you I mean I love walking around wearing somebody else yeah. in life. I mean, I'll take them for a walk. Unfortunately, and, you know, much to the irritation of those who live with me, I'll, if I'm, I've got an accent, the accent comes with me. And it's fun and it's really, it's playful. I've, I just played a German. So the German accent was really, it was so fun because it had a sensuality and I'm doing it wrong. But it really... It brings out a different person. Version it's of play. Me. It's a different yeah. version. And we have multitudes in ourselves. That's it. We I love that. Whoever said that we contain multitudes. Yes, I love that. I love that. And I, I also use that with dress. It's like I love dressing up because I think yeah. we can become many, many different things. We are different people depending on who we are I don't mean in a schizophrenic or multiple personality way but we have all these different sides so um and and putting them on and playing with them is the antidote to you know death <laughs> seriousness of life it, it's you know ultimately I get out of my it's like and being I go alive like, oh, isn't it yeah we've got to choose life and it's like the lip on the side of life and ultimately 
um, you've got to not take yourself so seriously or it. I mean, you can, obviously, when you're in pain, there's no choice. It's not about taking things seriously. But but if you can still play and have a laugh with somebody else, I love that. The other thing that really helps me is that the shortest distance between two people is laughter. And I really it's not sex. I think it's laughter. And that. I love that. Oh, yeah. my God, that's good. So if you have the potential for that, that's what it's about. So you've got to do things to play. You've got to instill reasons to play and not take your self so personally, I think. Um, I mean, I love what you're saying in the sort of freedom of it. Yeah. And in the vivacity and the kind of energy of being alive like letting yourself be a different person today by the lipstick you're wearing or the shirt you put on or the jewelry or the accent and that that is exciting and playful and creative and I think one of the terrible things of lockdown and then all this ghastly politics is that we've forgotten how to have fun we've forgotten how to play we none of us have enough play we're constantly sort of doom scrolling and miserable. And so I love the idea of connection is closest through laughter, not sex. Yeah. <laughs> My stage of life is probably more likely, frankly. <laughs> I think I think we that's definitely, I mean, I think sex is overrated, but that might say a lot about my sex. But <laughs> but um I you're very oh, sexy, that- Helena. Let me just oh, thanks. You. So you, Julia, actually, a bit of a girl crush going on. But um Yeah, very mutual. Yeah. Yeah, so nice. Well, hey. <laughs> <laughs> You're married, aren't you? Yeah. Oh, so am I. I am Virtually. married, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, we can love lots of people. That's the other thing, which I've always believed. And in. play. But... Play with being having a crush. Of course. Like it's playful. It is playful, and it's it's um it's a play of energy. And laugh and constructing sentences and construct and making things together. Any kind of that kind of relationship, just cons- it's um it's like building blocks, but doing it with sentences or thoughts. I think we're so overloaded with responsibilities. You know, the one good thing about COVID was the press pressing the pause, so we all had time to not answer seven thousand e- emails. We you know the barrage of life stopped. I felt for me, I was safe. I had my home. Um, no one was ill. We could cope. And then so I had the luxury of enjoying the fact that the world had stopped. Mm. So the inbox stopped. Then that thing, you know, the totally ridiculous thing about being an actor is you might not be in work, but you can see other people working. And for once, none of us are working. <laughs> So there's no envy like, and shit no I envy think she's got that part yeah yeah there's no feeling of threatened by other people it's very very dangerous to the profession because you can put your whole self-esteem in the hands of other people's success if you're not careful um so how do you hold on to your core self and your confidence and who you are internally given that all we've talked about of the different roles you can inhabit the projections put onto you, what you've, what's been carried down to you from your parents and your grandparents, maybe your great grandparents. How do you, you know, I think one of the great difficulties in life is finding how to stabilize oneself with a sense of, this is the core aspects of me that I, I can rely on, that regulate me, that keep me sort of connected with myself and alive. Um. Mm. alive in both not dead but also alive energetically rather than terrified all the time (laughs) (laughs) cowering under the um I think it changes from day to day um and I think you know it's very interesting how quick a sense of confidence can vanish I was talking about it with a really high achieving friend who was sort of saying, oh, I haven't done much with my life. And, and, and 
his his trials but you've done so much and you're like it's that sense of satisfaction or confidence just evaporates very very quickly um so true it is but the thing is you know I have a lot of compartments in my life so I'm not just an actor that's the other big challenge is how do you balance all the roles so I'm a mum to -hmm. two very different individuals I've I'm a daughter I'm really good at that. I will say that. Are you? I, that's a I, lovely I, thing. That's a good thing. Yeah, I think I get that. I think I really won't. And that's another thing. That's the big ask of you. I want to ask you about the big challenge. Okay. Um, okay. But so the mum, I have friends who have really put up with the fact that I've had to vanish for times in my life because when I become somebody else or go off on a job, it is all consuming. But they patiently wait for me to come back. I have a boyfriend I have uh, he's this is not the list of priority on the list of priorities I think no. it's not list of yeah. and um and now I'm doing things for charity I think I've always been quite eclectic and wanting to so I, I'm very aware of not to pigeonhole myself not reduce myself mm. and ultimately it's listening to the shitty committee. If my shitty committee really gets nasty, like the other day when I was dealing with watching myself in this latest program, I asked, I started to sing out loud what they were saying. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a really good antidote. Like, oh my God, yes, you're 56. Yes, the face is sagging. Oh my God, it's changing. Yes, you're getting old. You're getting old. <laughs> it just, and it really <laughs> and I think the sound man because I did it in the sound studio was just looking at me like as if I was completely I said yes I'm mad it doesn't really matter but this is what I carry inside and he said you said of course me every single person who walks this earth carries a shitty committee I love the name yes congratulations but once I started talking it out and I'm trying to I hope it won't breach her thing but I am trying to introduce this notion to my amazingly clever stunning daughter who has a very mm. hyperactive inner critic. I'm trying to point out that what that inner critic says is not fact. No. It is, it is feelings not. Feelings are not facts. facts. Yeah, feelings are not facts. Oh, there's so much I have learned from you, but oh, that was another thing that I was going to say. But, um, but, but, and what you tell yourself is not factual. So my, my CBT course really helps that. But now practical things that help, singing it out, yeah, so it's not um, hidden in shame. It grows in that horrible, topsy way that shame does in silence. Well, it can grow in all sorts of... Get it out. You've got to spit it out. I went through a very painful divorce without... Again, I don't want to breach people's privacy. Mm. But the way I cope with that was that I just got A4... I've got one here. You know, just a page of A4 shame. paper. Um, this... You know, I just go to Ryman's and I get 200 sheets. It's different from a diary. I just put the mic. I keep, I keep a diary. Sweetness. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> technical challenge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't hear you now. Something's gone. Georgie? Is that it? Yeah, you've got it. Is that more. better? Yeah. Sorry, I, I pressed the button. It's all right. I did yeah. it myself. Huh. <laughs> um, um, yeah. So, so you had the A4 pad that you wrote stuff down in to kind I of... I mean, I bought, I don't know, 500 of them because it was a long-lasting thing. Divorce does not... That's the other thing is it's not that fine. It never ends. It never yeah. ends. And even if you divorce somebody, the marriage, it's a kind of marriage. It's you're still with as if you have children with them. Particularly. So you have the, the relationship has to change. So um, and it's not just them, of course. Um, a divorce, and it's interesting how a divorce has so many the anatomy of a divorce and how many different griefs are, which had never occurred to me before until I did it. But what it does to your inside and what you have to grieve and what you have to lose and say goodbye yeah. to oh so many levels and layers and identities and identities. dreams of dreams, a family the all future, your future whatever you've yeah. attached to being the you as a matriarch if it is or you as the 
uh, with your team, with your family. Um, yeah. And then um, also what you are in relationship to groups of friends and the world in the family. It impacts the entire yeah. family. Yeah. Also how people don't necessarily know how to treat you. I think there's a lot of things that we should just need to tell people out there when dealing with people who's, if you're in any kind of grief, either divorce or loss, uh, losing somebody, you talk about it. You don't avoid it. You don't, yes. you don't walk change. Face it. You know, you face it and you name it. The person who's in grief is consumed by that person, whether they're yeah. leaving them or whether um, they've gone and they exist and you have to meet them bring that person into the space and talk about it and if also I'll just put it out there because it really came a cropper in my with some people when in our divorce that sometimes family you know friends don't know what to do and they don't I mean there's a split loyalty and they don't know contact both sides if you don't if you are worried about hurting somebody contact both sides and just check in and say would you yeah. mind if I saw so always yeah. respect what they had even if it's in your view the past or even if in your view it wasn't a good thing anyway it doesn't matter you have to the divorce and that the previous relationship and that person was theirs and part of the grieving is letting go and it takes a longer time than people expect much much longer, longer. the whole or than you want either you want to be over it like get you on want to be life. over it I think people often think um I think sometimes people were bored frankly of how long I grown moaned on about it and um I said look I don't want to be I'm bored by my own feelings but it, exactly. it is really really all consuming you can also become in, yeah and you can be very very selfish when you're in pain because it's so consuming you can't you don't think of other people's but literally because it's congested taking your every cell of your being processing it and it is a huge change so, so i do what think you talking it out helped you what else helped you i wrote when it wrote pain, i just literally wrote, wrote yeah i just wrote and wrote and wrote not to be read by anyone i wrote it i've got mm. i still got a drawer full of it I just draw, vomit it out. Um, I spoke to people who've been it. Always find the tribe, you know, yeah. who've been through it. Yeah. They'll show Good you idea. the way through the dark. You know, there's always mm. people who've done, have been through it before. You know, there's yeah. a general rule for life. You know, when you're young, you think I'm so unique and special and no one knows what I feel. And you go like, I'm sorry to tell you, but we're all basically <laughs> unoriginal. <laughs> Well, we have our own subjective experience, but divorce, talking to other people, what they've gone through normalizes the madness or the desperation that you feel. Or, and it can also give you advice about what to do with friends or your children, what to do with friends. Or... Also, the children. It's a very complicated thing how to share the children, all those patterns. Um, and also the knowledge, which I can tell now people who are going through it. And I'm now five. I mean, I'm years down the line that it gets so much easier. And it's that thing of um, it. You get it gets easier, but I I do think it changes. We, the intensity it changes. Changes. One thing I would bring back, which I found enormously hard, and again it was exacerbated by being well known, is that I couldn't walk around going. I kept on wanting to say I want to be in black. I want to wear something to indicate to people that I'm not my normal self. I'm in mourning. Got, yeah, I'm in mourning, and. I'm under reconstruction, you know, this is um, uh, polax to me. I'm, yeah, I'm, my scaffolding has, well, I've got no scaffolding. Sometimes scaffolding. I was just like, just gone. But until I've fallen apart, I won't be able to rebuild. So don't expect anything, frankly, of me, because I can't take anything. I, I found um, in the process, there was a lot of just disintegration. My brain couldn't make decisions yeah. because it was so congested with, I think, just processing. Preoccupation. Preoccupation. But also the, the part of the what you're saying is in some ways that the breakdown is the breakthrough, but you can't make it faster. You can't kind of press, you know, fast forward. You have, to, it's a painful disorienting kind of 
what's the word you're saying? Is that you feel like you're breaking inside, don't you? Like there's nothing that you, you have. It's a fragmentation. Yeah. Fragmentation, that's the word. Total fragmentation. And it's very scary. And the landscape is very, very desolate. And you feel very, very alone. And I'd only say to people who, and I, you know, I'll go through it again, no doubt, when somebody dies. But you, the only thing that I can say of help, I've been always taught is like, is the short view thing. You know, we have to try and just do the next minute. Keep it in the day. Keep it in the day. And that it's not um, real insight to human existence, isn't it? When one does and one will get stronger and you'll come together very much better, I do think. It's not a comfort because it's a fucker. Um, and being public figure made it worse because you wanted to wear black and look awful, but somehow because you were recognised, you couldn't. I think wandering around and um, being looked at, most of the time I can take it because I go, it's like whatever. I can wear a veil, as it were. Not literally a veal, but I mean, I just Psychologically, like, yeah. Psychologically, I realise, again, it's that thing. It's not really anything to do with me. You know, I privately have joy playing different people. The the side benefit is the fame thing. That's something that I deal with. And it's, and it's of great benefit many times. And a lot of the time it's of complete pain. Um, and it's a pain when you are not, when you are very vulnerable. I remember doing the school gate and feeling I was so vulnerable, and I couldn't. Mm. Obviously, meeting friends was fine, my my best friends, but not people I don't really know. Because no, um, you're raw and exposed. It was like I had not no skin. Yeah, yeah, and. Um, but that's when I say, not because I wanted to wear black, but I think we should, that's something that, you know, the Victorians had. We should have, you know, we should bring back um, a uniform for mourning because it gives an indication to people that you aren't yourself and nor should you be yourself. Yeah, yeah. And, I completely agree. Yeah, and it's it's called, I think I've got a thing with Alice saying, I'm not myself. I can't explain myself because I'm not myself. And that I like that. Yeah. And it and it sort of says, look, guys, because I think we still have trouble admitting vulnerability and, and there's a judgment about it and we should be strong. And there's a real legacy of the British stiff upper lip. And it's like we have to honour and respect loss and, in fact, not wear it as a badge, but have um, more protection or more or honour it more. You know, in our society and press pause, the time when you really need to have a sort of lockdown after a death just to let yourself heal. Completely. And space, space in which to recalibrate. Yes. And with birth, too. You know, I've had a relative who's just had a baby go like, you've no idea the shock of having a birth. It is yeah. for me with, with death and birth, and if I lost my dad very quickly after I had Bill, but it was also he was amazing because he he my dad wanted to live to when Billy was born. But oh. they were both like, and that was a real act of generosity. But they're both mini earthquakes to yourself, you know, that's like the tectonic plates go flying up. Totally shift, yeah, yeah. And then, and then you have to just wait till they come down to start walking. And I think people try to run way before it's sensible. It's quite interesting that a lot of the parts you play go back in time. And psychologically, I mean, we can't fully know what life was like then, we can imagine. No. But I think there is something about the speed of 21st century life that expects you to keep going and the kind of 24-7 news and your emails and the pressure and all of those things and being able to get to places. Their t life was just slower. Of course, there was more death because children died and, and basically you got ill, you died. Because yeah. There was no medicine. But I think there was a... And there were lots of terrible things about it. So I'm not saying it's better then, but there's something about the slower pace of life honours these big life events of birth and death and separation and moving house or all the different types of losses. 
because go, we need to slow down in order to allow ourselves to feel and to be able to Absolutely. allow that to come through our system. And as it does that, it allows us to change and adapt to our new circumstance. But this, you know, chop, chop, get on with it, push forward, push forward is, is a real illness and really bad for our mental health. I think it's really bad for our, our mental health and our physical health. Yeah, and I think it's yeah. sometimes impossible. What I mean, I do go to work to escape because the barrage of decisions that I, I'm meant to, I'm meant to make. But then, to quote my guru mother, she said, "One rule is don't ever do anything today that you can postpone till tomorrow." You know, <laughs> <laughs> that is the opposite, isn't it, of everybody else? But it's genius, isn't it? It is actually the way to survive. Postpone. So we, we postpone. <laughs> Don't do anything today that you can do tomorrow. And that is <laughs> that's a great to be in badges. Yeah. 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 So listen, we are coming to the yeah. end, very unfortunately. And I'm going to make a request which may not be possible. But I would love to talk to you about your the challenge that you kind of just slipped in momentarily, which was about your mum, yeah. which we haven't even touched no. on, but we couldn't start now because I think it's there's a lot there. So maybe we could have a part two at some point. I'd love a part two. That's the my life is haunted by the potential loss. Not potential, it's obviously going to happen, but the loss of my mum. I've lost my father, but every grief is different for obvious reasons so I wanted to know from you and maybe we, we postpone it is there anything that we can do to prepare for death of somebody but with a um with their agreement <laughs> and um um yes is there anything that we can we can do to prepare for them to make a good death and for our own selves and how to is there anything I could do to help myself survive life after it's a big one so I'd like to have a part two but I can give yeah. you a short I can give you a short answer great I've got my notepad hang on <laughs> yes Guru. so <laughs> <laughs> listen i'm just trying this out this may not yeah, yeah. Work okay 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 but the fact that you're thinking about it already that that is part of your consciousness is the first step to preparing so it's not like mm -hmm. you're in blissful ignorance this isn't going to happen so you are i imagine when you go and see your beloved mum you're kind of aware you know maybe this time you know, I've only got 50 more of these visits to do. You know, you're aware that time is narrowing, that her, her life yeah. on earth is shorter. And I mean, the first thing, which I'm sure she and you've already have, is to have any of the conversations that you did, that are important to have, that you don't have regrets, whether that's to do with your relationship in the past, whether that's to do with actual pra practical plans like, what does she want for her funeral? Does she want to be on a on a life support machine? Does she have end of life planning and advanced wishes? Those practical mm -hmm. things. Um, and do that possibly with your two brothers so that you, because yeah. I think after a parent's died, that wish, that kind of wondering, what would mum want? You know, and yeah. one says, well, she said to me this, and the other one says, she, she said to me that, yeah, yeah. and that's conflicted. So that if you can have that, collaboratively together yeah. that really helps that's and good the, that's good tip and the other one is being present which I think you really are in the moments that you have with her and really cherish them and embrace them and create opportunities because in the end all you will have is those memories and they will be your treasure trove to go back and revisit after she's died Mm -hmm. And they will resource you in the same way as your dad is still very present in you. And you can remember the conversations you had before he died when Billy was born. That, mm. you know, although your relationship with your mum, I imagine, because she's a mother and not a father, is very different. Like, when you're with her, like, make sure you have the conversations that will nurture you and 
allow you to feel close and loving to her because as you know the love for her won't die um no. and then the the final piece in this short bit is basically you can do these things and at the moment of death you're never prepared it is always a shock you can have be told two hours before someone is going to die that they're going to die by the end of the day or whatever it is mm. and still that moment when they stop breathing is like <gasps> it is yeah. just unbelievably shocking that's my short version thank you but we can go into each of those long form I'd love to I can't it's another long one was like I wanted to know how you got so involved with death but that's a long one. I can <laughs> tell you that. It's from my childhood, obviously. Oh, really? I mean, I wasn't bereaved, but lots of people, my parents were very significantly bereaved. Did they lose their parents? Or? So my mum, by the time she was 25, she was an orphan. Her mother, her father, her sister and her brother had all died. And my father, his father and his brother. And they never talked about any of them. My oh, uncle was killed in the war. Mm. Um, my grandmother was an alcoholic. My mum was an alcoholic. Um, so there was, there's a lot, but I'll tell you. Oh, yeah. No, that's what a legacy. Yeah. Well, I have done. loved this conversation, Helena. No, Thank me too. So much. I really feel like we, I felt, you know, that there was so much that you've obviously thought about that has sort of come out, but it does feel like as it's coming out, you're understanding yourself better and more with more clarity. And one of the things I would say back to you is that you ha you say this about yourself, that you're scattered or disorganized. And my response to you is that you have much more kind of centered wisdom and um, uh, grounded sense of self than you probably recognize. Mm. I think that's my father Aww. I mean I'm made of both and I'm yeah. also I don't know if you believe in all that but I do find it has uncanny but but not not that but astrologically um yeah. I'm a Gemini mm. so I have this Gemini um I've got a, a knee-jerk reaction to get to have lots of what well, we all have millions of ideas occur and um I think also postmenopausal, the brain changes. Definitely and, changes. You know, my brain has definitely changed since I've had the menopause and during the menopause. That's a whole other challenge. So, um, and that's the other thing that I think I've learned is that every decade is a different learning lesson. You know, I'm doing my 50s now. And the challenges now are obviously completely different from when they were 40s. And we've never done this age before unless we really have lived before. You know, so it's, um, well, everything's new. I wanted. But do you feel more, I don't want to say, a sense of knowing yourself and well-being and optimism in your 50s than you did? Definitely, because I've gotten yeah. to know myself. Yeah. yeah, I've gotten to know how to live with myself and not take myself, not be my, not have myself take up so much time. Yeah. You know, it's just <laughs> Give pushing break, away. Like give myself a break it's like oh just whatever get over yourself and then be <laughs> and open to the world you know and, and play and, all, and play and um experiment and taste and explore and ask and I do love people that's why I act is I'm curious about how people put together and I don't think it's a million miles away my mother's psychotherapist so no. in some ways I deconstruct people and I'm always interested in playing ill people, actually. And I didn't realize that until I suddenly thought, oh, that's so I always go like, well, how did they become this way? How do people? And then I deconstruct that. So it was that sort of story. So it's um, no, it's sort of as, as you get older, I think you get more used to yourself and then it opens up the possibility of actually being alive, you know, being living yeah. and having fun for fuck's sake. Yeah, have fun. <laughs> I love <laughs> That's a wonderful place to end. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. So Anytime, much. Julia. Anytime. What and again, thank you joy. for everything. Oh, totally my pleasure. Thank you. Not at all. So does this end or do I, do I meet your so, daughters or not? Do they just discuss things after? They discuss things after. <laughs> 
so I don't get to meet them. Can I meet them another time? You can definitely meet them another time. They'd love okay. to meet you another time. No, I'd love to meet them. 